Thank you very much, Susitha. And um, I'm very honoured to be invited here. And um, can I personally thank all of you for being so generous and delightful um, in hosting me here. It's a, it's a real pleasure. Um, I'm going to talk about... I don't need that platform. That's good. Um, I'm going to talk about uh, forensic patients. And forensic patients, of course, are the same patients that we look after in child and adolescent psychiatry in adult psychiatry, but we look after them in different settings. And I'm hoping that for all of us, not just forensic psychiatrists, uh, the take-home messages really are about including forensic patients in system planning and ensuring that their access to mental health care of an equivalent standard is available to them. All over the world, the number of prisoners has been increasing significantly over recent years, mainly due to public policies which are tough on crime. Uh, as a result, the prison population now exceeds 10 million, predominantly in the United States and in China. Sri Lanka is doing reasonably well in incarceration rates. We consider that low incarceration rates are a good marker of functioning criminal justice systems and alternatives to prison. So Sri Lanka is marked here with a rate of around 100 per 100,000 people. And you can compare that to the United States, which is almost off the graph, and where a significant number, particularly of African-American men, are detained. So I'm going to talk a little about some of the arguments for why good mental health care in prisons is not too hard to achieve and actually brings significant benefits in a range of different domains. As I said, prison populations are not a separate population. They're in a separate setting. Almost all prisoners will return to the community. And what that means is that we have a very significant opportunity for intervention uh, to assess a person's needs and to perhaps set them up with interventions going into the community which will reduce their risk of reoffending and improve their life. And of course, improve the welfare of the community if we can reduce their offending. There are some significant obstacles to this though. The first of those is funding and here, um, Sri Lanka does not do well compared to the rest of the world in terms of the amount of money devoted to the health care of prisoners. Um, and while acknowledging that um, it's, it's not a, a wealthy country, Sri Lanka could still obviously focus more on providing equivalent health care to that which would be provided to a public patient in a public hospital. Nevertheless, there are still opportunities that can be made with small resources, and I'm going to talk a little about those at the end. The prison numbers also indicate, uh, and probably you can't see at the very bottom, but that the significant problem is of overcrowding with, according to these statistics from 2021, 186% of capacity. And so prisons really holding twice the number that they were designed for. I'm going to introduce you to Sina Fazel. Sina is a professor of forensic psychiatry at Oxford University, trained in old age psychiatry and forensic. Um, he spent a little bit of time in Melbourne, in Australia, some 25 years ago. Um, but Sina is a phenomenal epidemiologist. He does amazing work with data sets, particularly from Scandinavia, which has very well developed data linkage capacity. And as a result of well constructed research, is able to answer some very significant epidemiological questions about the associations between offending, substance use, and a range of other um, details. And I'm going to take you through some of his research. The first is that in large systematic reviews, the prevalence of psychosis consistently across the world is higher in prison populations than in the equivalent community. Not only psychosis, but also significant mood disorders and it will come as no surprise for you to, to know that substance use disorders are also highly represented. Despite the fact that people with mental disorder are often diverted from the criminal justice system, that is that they don't actually enter into it because someone is able to take them to hospital rather than to prison, we still have a markedly increased rate of psychotic illnesses. And just as a digression, I recently marked a PhD thesis from New South Wales, uh, a database linkage on a population of around 8 million people. Uh, the author was able to follow all cases diagnosed with schizophrenia in the public system over 20 years and link to criminal justice databases. 
Now, when I was a medical student, I was told that people with schizophrenia had no greater rate of criminal offending than the rest of the population, and that is clearly untrue. In the New South Wales sample, 10% of all criminal offences committed in the state were committed by people with schizophrenia. So 10% is a very significant number of the offences. Obviously, not all people with schizophrenia are committing the offences, but what it does mean is that the likelihood of a person with schizophrenia committing an offence compared to the rest of the population is significantly higher. These numbers here suggest that if one in 25 prisoners has a psychotic illness, this is a great opportunity to take people into treatment and, while they're detained, to provide them with the long-term treatment, often with injectable medications or with sustained compliance, which we know is associated with better outcomes in the longer term. Other studies that Fazell's group has done here focus on low and middle income co countries and they demonstrate that that rate of psychosis is also increased. So this is not a finding just of the West. Uh, and in particular, you'll see that the, the risks were higher for women um, and that major depression was, um, it was a very huge proportion of the people. And this is not simply an, an adjustment to prison. This is a, a clinical diagnosis rather than an adjustment disorder. Post-traumatic stress disorder, markedly increased, and the rate in female prisoners, again, is consistent across the world. Female prisoners usually have lives which are marked by violence, sexual abuse, substance use, family violence, unstable relationships, and a range of other psychosocial adversities. So again, we often think of prisoners as causing trauma to other people, but as psychiatrists, we know very well that those, those counter-transferences are easily dismissed. In fact, this is a population who is deserving of um, sympathy, uh, often deserving of interventions which address some of the uh, problems which have caused them, in fact, to, to end up offending. Substance use disorders in all studies are markedly increased. And again, this is a great opportunity not just for detoxification, not just for brief interventions, but actually for commencing pharmacotherapies and for linking people to future uh, interventions which may increase the likelihood of abstinence. A similar systematic review and meta-analysis of post-traumatic stress disorder. Um, of course, this is variable across the world depending upon the context. And obviously in countries such as Sri Lanka, which have had civil wars and have had other unrest, you can expect the likelihood of post-traumatic stress disorder to be increased. So I'm going to move on to some of the specifics about the Sri Lankan prison data. Um, the Sri Lankan prison system produces a very comprehensive set of statistics, which, like all government departments, um, are compiled and then sit there, doing nothing towards the, the use of that data to inform public policy. Similarly, we have limited epidemiological knowledge of the mental health needs, but the, the studies that have been done have firstly shown, not unexpectedly, higher rates of alcohol use, higher rates of cannabis use in offenders, and higher rates of heroin use. I think the estimate was a quarter of a million heroin users in the population of Sri Lanka, but a significant number, around 10% of the prison population, being remanded for drug-related offences. The rates of adverse childhood experiences, obviously a theme which is increasingly prevalent at conferences, um, was, was clearly increased, and particularly in female prisoners. The female prisoners showed an astonishing preponderance of psychotic illness. So once more, a clear opportunity for intervention. But the main thing that's really telling, I suppose, is that despite 70 or 80 pages of prison data, very little of that actually reflects on issues of public health relevance, the, the incidence of various illnesses, physical illnesses, communicable diseases, and so forth. The death rate of prisoners was significantly increased. Uh, I think it was something like um, two, two prisoners per, um, per 200 people dying every year. So a, a rate of around 1% of prisoners dying, but no indication of what the cause of death was, whether that was suicide or through, um, through natural illness. There are particular opportunities to intervene for specific populations. Juveniles across the world are focused upon, firstly, to separate them from adult prisoners so they don't learn bad habits, but also because the plasticity of 
the youth brain gives an opportunity for intervention which may divert away from offending in the future. Female populations require different sorts of interventions with a particular focus on substance use, the treatment of psychotic illness and addressing trauma. Elderly prisoners across the world are an increasing group, predominantly because of tough on crime policies, but also because of the increasing prosecution of historical sexual abuse. Um, but they have unique needs in prison and can be highly vulnerable. And then finally, people with intellectual disability. Very few prison systems screen for cognitive impairment, and it's much more difficult in a country in which lower levels of education for some of the population may cause or confound the diagnosis of an intellectual disability for people who haven't attended formal schooling. So these are populations, again, that it's worth recognising at reception into prison to determine if there are specific, cheap, easily reproduced interventions for populations that we know will benefit. And of course, Sri Lanka, although no one has been executed for some years, still has the death penalty. And again, this is something which internationally, the World Psychiatric Association uh, is beginning to advocate more strongly on behalf of vulnerable people, because we know that a number of these cases are people with cognitive impairments, or in some cases with psychotic illnesses, who haven't been afforded the opportunity for a good quality psychiatric examination, and haven't been afforded the quality evidence which might actually commute that sentence away from the death penalty. Not just mental health, but also physical health issues are a really simple opportunity for intervention. We know that we have a range of health profiles which are clearly adverse compared to the rest of the population. But we also know that when prisoners come into prison, many of them actually improve in their physical health status because of abstinence from substance use, perhaps because of a good diet, um, stable accommodation. That's not to say that prison's a great place, but it does mean that for some particular health profiles, it's beneficial for people. But as COVID showed as well, uh, putting people in prison is sometimes devastating when you put people into a closed environment and there are infectious diseases available. And I understand you had some unrest in prisons associated with this. All across the world, we saw a drop in prison populations of 10 to 15% as COVID struck and judges became reluctant to sentence prisoners with lower level offences to prison. Um, but it's clear also that detention during COVID has been very problematic for people. Quarantining, um, isolating people, uh, the access to, to protective equipment for staff, rendering assessment very complicated. As I said before, being in prison has its own mental health consequences, um, particularly in cultures in which this is um, something to be ashamed of, where people will feel humiliation or might be estranged from their family or rejected as a consequence of offending. We also know that um, a loss of connection with family really doesn't help people reintegrate into the community. So in fact, preserving family links, whether through video conference, telephone, face-to-face -face visits is really critical. And particularly for female prisoners, access to their children um, is a really important part of maintaining their mental health during incarceration. After release from prison is a particularly vulnerable time, uh, particularly for people who are opiate addicted and who come out of prison opioid naive or having detoxed, um, and who then return to opioid use but uncertain of the amount or the strength that they should be using. So we know that death from an overdose is drastically increased, as is death from suicide in the first year. So this is data from Stuart Kinner, who runs the Justice Health Unit at the University of Melbourne, um, and is involved in prison health as a public health issue internationally. And what he's shown is that the rate of death in the first week uh, is so significant that in many cases, we can think about interventions which might assist people. In particular, the use of long-acting injectable buprenorphine is now routine in some American prisons and in Australian prisons. Um, it's a partial opiate agonist which offers up to a month of um, blockade of opiate receptors. Um, so it means that people are not craving, but also should they use heroin or other opiates, they're not prone to overdose in the same way. We have mentioned low levels of funding, but there are other opportunities which um, could be taken in Sri Lanka with the appropriate data and systems in place. Um, we have 
uh, a fabulous workforce. Um, I've been very privileged to work with a number of your forensic psychiatrists in Australia. Um, and I can see that the workforce has really significant talent and really good opportunity to develop a network across Sri Lanka. Um, I wonder, however, about the opportunities for other disciplines, forensic psychologists, mental health nurses trained in forensic specialties. So the challenge is there to really develop an integrated system which has multidisciplinary skills. And then finally, um, I was just at the World Psychiatric Association conference in Bangkok where it was mentioned that, uh, that there was one country in the whole of Asia that had mental health legislation, which was from the 19th century, but it didn't mention any particular names, you'll be pleased to know. Um, but again, there are opportunities to reform legislation which I understand are, are underway, but I, I think that's probably um, a priority because it enables you to focus upon human rights, it enables you to develop um, metrics which include recovery and to focus upon contemporary approaches to the treatment of mental health problems in compulsory systems. The argument for the mental health care of prisoners firstly comes from the notion of equivalence, that is that all people should be able to access an equivalent level of care regardless of gender or age or location, so that prisoners deserve the same level of health care as others. It comes from a public health basis because prisoners return to the community and if this is a place where they um, are infected with blood-borne viruses, tuberculosis or other illnesses, and they return to the community, they will be the reservoir of those infections, therefore. It's an economic argument because prisons are expensive and prisoners don't pay taxes, they simply use the public dollar. So the more you can close down prison beds, the more you can actually um, use that money for alternative um, investments. But also, effective health care in prison can lead to a reduction in offending. So the numbers to the left show that treatment with antipsychotics, with stimulants for people who have ADHD, and for addiction drugs such as opiate substitutes, significantly reduce reoffending rates. So if you can take your population with psychosis and get them onto long-acting injectable antipsychotics, you have opportunities to reduce offending for the future. The model is a fairly straightforward one. It involves screening at the time of reception, and all prisoners are screened for mental and physical health problems. But a, a mental health nurse who's able to screen at reception using a small structured tool, we use a cut-down brief psychiatric rating scale. Um, there are a couple of specific screening tools. It takes 10 to 15 minutes and enables you to pick the population who require further exploration. You triage those to an appropriate uh, assessment, um, and that assessment then means that your psychiatrists aren't being used to look at patients who don't have significant mental health problems. And you can use the complex skills of formulation to determine who needs the interventions going forward. And then finally, recovery planning, reintegration planning, beginning at the time of reception, obviously the opportunity to link people back to community services. So really, it's an effective use of resources and one which has a high yield and a high likelihood of, uh, of gaining access to a population who will benefit from intervention. So there is some optimism to be said about the mental health care of prisoners, and I'm going to stop just there.